Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Paul the Apostle, in his letter to the church at Thessalonica, said, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Accordingly to the Lord's own word, we tell you, that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. These verses contain within them what is known as eschatology. This word is taken from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. Eschatology is the study of events. The events of the last things or end times. Bible prophecy gives us some glimpses into future events related to end times. The Encyclopedia of Bible Prophecy by J. Barton Payne states that there are 6,641 verses in the Old Testament and 1,711 verses in the New Testament that contain predictive material. The Apostle Peter in his second letter wrote, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Prophecy being a prediction. Easton's Bible Dictionary says prophecy or prediction was one of the functions of the prophets. It has been defined as a miracle of knowledge, a declaration or description or representation of something future beyond the power of human understanding to foresee or to discern or conjecture. The great prediction, which runs like a golden thread through the whole contents of the Old Testament, is that regarding the coming and the work of the Messiah. And the great use of prophecy was to perpetuate faith in his coming and to prepare the world for that event. But there are many subordinate and intermediate prophecies which also hold an important place in the great chain of events which illustrate the sovereignty and the all-wise overruling providence of God. But note that much caution and discernment is needed in these days when listening to teachings or reading books on end time teaching. There has been so much speculation to the detriment of the church. But listen to this. One quarter of biblical books are prophetic, with fully one fifth of all biblical material being prophetic in content. The study of prophecy can be discredited by those who go beyond the Bible's statements about the future. Furthermore, one has to contend with the differences amongst Christians as to their particular interpretations and beliefs concerning future events. Therefore, believers, we have to be gentle with each other concerning uh, these various differences. We must all focus on what really matters that Christians 
disciples, follower of Jesus, all have the same destiny to be with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout eternity. This is the most important factor and should supersede and temper the differences surrounding one's own theological school of thoughts when it pertains to eschatology. Now, concerning end times, there have been basically four biblical views. There's historical premillennialism. The word pre means before, before the thousand year reign of Christ, hence the millennial reign of Christ. Basically, this was a common belief of the early church through the first four centuries. It was taught that the New Testament church age we are in right now would lead into a tribulation period of seven years in which the world would experience the wrath and fury of the Lord for their rejection of him. Accordingly, or according to the beliefs, Jesus would suddenly appear in the clouds at the end of the seven years, and believers both living and dead would be gathered to him and then return with the Lord immediately to reign over Jerusalem. At the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, the world would be judged and purified by fire, and then all believers will live throughout eternity on the earth with Christ. This was the school of thought for end-time eschatology, the first 400 years of the church. Then there's amillennialism, which this view came from St. Augustine around 400 AD. The belief was that the thousand-year reign was symbolic and that the millennial or millennium is the current spiritual reign of Christ until he returns. When he returns, it will be to rule and reign physically with the church. With this belief, there is no tribulation and no thousand-year reign. And this is a view of the Catholic Church and, and old mainline Protestant denominations. Then you have post-millennialism. This view came about in the 17th century through what was called rationalistic revolution of thinking. Developed in the mid-1600s by a Unitarian minister named Daniel Whitby, the belief was that the church would eventually influence the world and usher in the kingdom of God here on earth. Then Jesus would return. The challenge that man is perfectible experienced a huge dilemma because of the horrors of World War I. This view also had to ignore certain prophecies in the Bible and then reinterpret other prophecies to, to make it fit within their theology. And then there is modern pre-millennialism or futuristic millennialism. This view came about in the early 1800s from the studies of John Nelson Darby, an ex-Anglican priest who withdrew and adhered to a group of Christians who had separated themselves from the established churches. They called themselves the Brethren. And because they lived in Plymouth, England, they came to be known as the Plymouth Brethren. Darby realized from Scripture that God dealt with people through different periods of time, which Darby called dispensations. And in the early 1900s, Darby's beliefs were reworked by C.I. Schofield and became the source of notes for the Schofield Bible. The Brethren movement grew in the second half of the 19th century and it had leaders such as George Mueller. Also, the China Inland Mission was supported by the Brethren. Eventually, the dispensationalism Theology was being accepted by many American evangelists such as Dwight L. Moody, F.F. F. Bruce, and even Harry Ironside. One of the greatest works came from an American Baptist pastor, Bible teacher, and writer named Clarence Larkin. When World War I broke out in 1914, he prepared a work called Dispensational Truth, which contained a number of charts with descriptive matter, and this book has been one of the best on the subject, and you can still purchase it today. So I want to jog your memory right now. Some of you older people 
will know the lyrics and the tune and even the author and maybe even have owned the album that the song was on. Here are the lyrics. Life was filled with guns and war and all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. The children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun is coming, you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed, she hears a noise and turns her head, he's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill, one disappears and one left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. The father spoke, the demons dined. How could you have been so blind? There's no time to change your mind. The sun is coming, you've been left behind. I hope we'll all be ready. You've been left behind. The song obviously is titled, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And it's by Larry Norman. And the album title was Upon This Rock, put out in 1969. And being saved or born again in the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s, the preaching you would have heard in certain pulpits and small Bible studies or in street evangelism or Christian festivals and concerts were peppered with the message that Jesus was coming back. He was coming in the clouds to receive his bride, the church. And all those who were believers and followers of Jesus would be taken from this earth in what is called the rapture. And this is what makes up dispensationalism theology. So with all this being said, we will start with one of the greatest promises in Scripture concerning future prophetic events, the return of Jesus, also known as the second advent of the Lord. But before we do this, I want to give some background that will help us in our understanding of the text we are studying. Acts chapter 17 gives us a glimpse into Paul's encounter with the Thessalonians. He was basically driven out of Thessalonica, located in modern Greece, uh, and he was driven out by some jealous Jews, and then he fled to Berea. Then those same Jews went to Berea and again stirred up trouble against Paul. Timothy was then sent to Thessalonica at a later date to follow up and continue the teachings that were already in place. As we survey this letter, it becomes obvious that in a short time, Paul was that in the short time that Paul was in Thessalonica, his teachings had a profound effect and a church was established there. So we pick it up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6, 6 through 9. It says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. As you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, the Lord's message ran out from you, rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then he says in chapter 2, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Now, it's important that we see what the Thessalonians were so concerned about. There was intense persecution against those who believed and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ at that time. So we pick it up again in chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. It says, For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They despise God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. It is most probable that some of the Thessalonian believers had been killed for their faith, while other believers most likely died from natural causes. This would have brought up some important questions like, what happens to those believers who have died? Will they be left behind in their graves when the Lord returns? Remember, the teachings of the early church were seasoned with the promises of the return of Jesus. 
Paul even wrote to the Thessalonians about this truth. In verse 10 of chapter 1, he says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Even Jesus spoke of his return. He told his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then we see in the book of Revelation, behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So we can see that Christ's return was being taught throughout the early church. Paul was answering the concern of the people when he penned the text we are studying. And he wanted to comfort the church. So he wrote to them saying this, Brothers, we do not want you to ignore, or I'm sorry, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or die, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, those that have died, according to the Lord's own word. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul lets the people know that their family and friends that have died were not going to be forgotten. The words fallen asleep mean deceased or departed or dead. But with this text comes something very significant, significant concerning the Lord's return. So number one on your outline, within modern premillennialism theology, the return of Jesus will be in two phases. The return of Jesus will be in two phases. For the Lord himself, he says, will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so that we will be with the Lord forever. Notice he's coming in the clouds. At this point, he's, his feet are not touching the Mount of Olives. Number two, within modern premillennialism theology, the first phase is called the rapture. In verse 17 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, it says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever, caught up. In the Greek means to be taken. It means to be plucked. It means to, to be caught away, to be pulled. In the Latin, the word for caught up is rapturo, from which comes the term rapture. Again, it means to catch away speedily, to seize by force, for Satan will seek to hinder our rapture to heaven, to claim for oneself, just as the bridegroom claims the bride, or to move to a new place, or to rescue from danger. To be caught up is to be raptured. Letter A, within the rapture, there is the resurrection of the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those that have died, their, their bodies will be uh, resurrected, and their, their spirit will meet their new resurrected bodies. That will happen first. And then letter B, within the rapture, there is the translation of the living saints. And then it says this, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. We'll be caught up together with them. 
Sounds like a sci-fi movie. And we've seen some of the movies they have put out, A Thief in the Night. And then they, back in the 70s, they came out with a new one. Uh, I believe it was uh, late 1900s, early 2000s. They came out with another one, updated it and all. Uh, it, it's, it sounds like a sci-fi movie that all of a sudden, everywhere, uh, one day in the future, Christians are going to disappear from this earth. But according to Scripture, I don't know how you can read this any other way. Number three on your outline, the rapture will be exclusive. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. The day of the rapture, when that happens in the twinkle of an eye, as we're being caught up, we will be given our heavenly bodies. We will be changed. There will be a transformation. We are entering into a whole new dimension spiritually. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality. And that's going to happen during the rapture of the church if we are still alive when it happens. If not, our, our bodies will be resurrected and rejoined with our spirits that I believe go to heaven when we die. But at the rapture, they'll be united together and we will have new bodies. And I also believe this, only those who have trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be taken in the rapture. Now, number four, the rapture will take place abruptly. Matthew 24 says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Revelation 16, 15 says, look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. I mean, this is speaking of, uh, like, as the movie said, a thief in the night. There's been all kinds of predictions throughout history of the, of the second coming of Christ. Dates have been given and people have, have basically sold things and, 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 and huddled together. Uh, expecting that day to, to be truthful and because after all, it's charismatic preachers that are preaching this and all of a sudden that day does not happen. And the reason why is because the, even the son doesn't know. Only the father knows when that day will happen. Hence, number five on your outline, the date and time of the rapture is unknown. The date and time of the rapture is unknown. Jesus said, no one knows about the day or hour, nor even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. But only the father. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own, the, uh, the Father has set by his own authority. There is one important factor that all Christians need to understand. There are some things that God has not chosen to reveal to us. And this is one of them. This is one of them. And as a parent, the rapture can take place at any time. It is also apparent that Paul and the rest of the early church believed that the Lord was coming back. They may not have believed what we're looking at right now, but they believed that Christ was going to return. Paul used the word, we who are still alive and are left. Paul placed himself in a group who were still alive. He possessed the conviction that Jesus was going to return in his lifetime. 
And because of this conviction, even the early church, they lived their lives as if Jesus would return at any moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Again in 1 Corinthians, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. Yes, the early church lived as if Jesus could come back at any moment, that his kingdom would be established. But I also want to share, number six, that, that the rapture will take place before the tribulation because God's people are not appointed unto his wrath. The rapture will take place before the tribulation because God's people are not appointed unto his wrath. And I want to go back because, you know, reiterate number three, point number three, that the rapture will be exclusive. It will be exclusive. This is an exclusive event. And we're not appointed unto God's wrath. First Thessalonians chapter one says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Christ will rescue us. He will snatch us away before that coming wrath. Romans 5, 9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, 3 through 6, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. And it is by grace you have been saved. God's people are not appointed to suffer his wrath. Remember the very meaning of the words caught up, testify as to God's people being moved to a new place or rescued from danger. The argument is that believers have always suffered persecution, persecution which has led to torture and death. But that persecution has always been the wrath of man under the influence of Satan. We are now talking about the wrath of God. And I find it very, very difficult to believe that Jesus, the groom, would appoint his church, the bride, to experience the wrath of the Father. Revelation 3.10 since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Notice Jesus says, I will keep you from, which basically means out of. He did not say, I will keep you through it. He said, I will keep you from it. And what is the hour of trial he's talking about? Well, after the rapture, there'll be a seven-year period of time in which the second part of that seven-year period, three and a half years, is going to be what's called the hour of trial. Matthew 24, 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. I'm going to read that again. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor even shall be. This prophecy pertains to the great tribulation. Again, it's a seven-year period with the last three and a half years being such horror that the world has never experienced. It is during this tribulation period that the wrath of God will be poured out upon the wickedness of man. Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2 says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will, there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, 
your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Will be delivered. That was written centuries before by the prophet Daniel. And again, we look at Revelation 6, 15 through 17. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich and the mighty and every slave, every free man, hidden caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand it? We're not appointed unto that as believers. And in this tribulation, in this dispensational theology, there are those that believe, well, well, the church won't be raptured until halfway through. Until halfway through. And I don't, I don't, I still, I don't believe that. The Holy Spirit is going to be removed. Scripture says at the beginning of the tribulation. He's going to back off, so to speak. He's going to move. And the son of perdition, or the, the man of perdition, being Satan, the Antichrist, will come upon the stage of human history. And he'll have a false prophet. And there's going to be, we're going to talk about this in the future here, but there'll be all kinds of things and deception happening. And I don't believe that the church will be going through that. I believe in a pre-millennialism, a pre-tribulation rapture. There are even those that believe that the rapture is not going to happen until the end of the tribulation, which makes no sense at all. But listen to this. Why did Paul tell the church to encourage each other with these words pertaining to being caught up in the clouds? And why did Paul use the phrase blessed hope concerning the Lord's appearing? Certainly he did not mean that we are to call the day of the Lamb's wrath a blessed hope. Titus 2 verses 11 through 13 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This is what we're to do right now. We are to, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace that's been given us, and in view of that grace, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and we are to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age as we wait expectantly for his return. In fact, the scripture says, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe the blessed hope that Paul is talking about is the promised hope of the coming rapture of the church. Now, there are a lot of people that say, no, the rapture, it's just too new to be true. It's just too new because it's, it, 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 it came about in the 1800s, this whole idea of a rapture of the church. To me, I just look at Scripture, it just keeps making sense. So what are we to do as we wait for this day? Number six on your outline, Christians are to be in a constant state of expectancy. A constant state of expectancy. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left the house to be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect them. So there are two ways that the world thinks when it comes to death and resurrection. Sigmund Freud wrote, And finally there is the painful riddle of death, for which no remedy at all has been found, nor probably ever will be. Basically, that's how some people look at death. It's a finality, that's it, there's nothing, we can't even figure it out. The Greeks had inscriptions on tombs in ancient Greece and Rome, which indicated that death was their greatest enemy and that they saw no hope beyond the grave. 
And then there are those who, in their disbelief in Scripture, they scoff. They scoff at biblical prophecy. Peter said, dear friends, this is, how my, my second, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. I have heard people talk like this. Uh, people think like this because they do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They do not have a relationship with him. They're still blinded by the God of this world. So I say, as we wait expectantly for the blessed hope for the rapture, I say we need to pray for the scoffers that the Lord will open their eyes while we wait for the promise of meeting the Lord in the air and the twinkling of an eye and the fact that we will all be changed. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we can earnestly await his return for us because we are promised. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Encourage each other with these words. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope that we have, that you are coming soon. I pray, Father, that you would give us a spirit of expectancy. Help us to think on you especially in these times that are so confusing and so much chaos going on in our world right now. Could it be that you are shaking the foundations of this world, trying to get the attention of those that you have created, those that you love? For you love everyone. You die. You sent your son to die for the whole world. And man has been given the ability to respond to that love. And I ask you, Father, for those that are scoffers, those that don't believe, open their eyes before it's too late. As in the days of Noah, this time that we are living in, this dispensation of grace will end, just like it did in Noah's day. It sounded so crazy that water was going to fall from the sky and people would be drowned. And it sounds so crazy that Jesus is going to return to this earth in the clouds and people that have died that believed in him are going to be resurrected and Christians on this earth are going to be caught up with them in the clouds to be with Jesus. That sounds just more absurd than rain falling from heaven in a major flood. Yet we do know this. During the flood, there was a dispensation, a dispensation of grace, Lord, in which the day came when the ark was finished, everything was in place, and, and your word says you shut the door. I know there's a time coming where that rapture will take place, and you're going to shut that door, and your wrath is going to be poured out. Father, I pray, give us a heart to understand this truth. Give us a passion to speak to people boldly that you are returning soon. I remember as an early believer, that was on our heart all the time. As we get older, as we get into life, it's not so prominent on our minds. Help us, Lord, to remember the day is coming and may we all be ready.